Well, I was picking up a program here. Let's end with a program or two from Guess the Program, if that's okay with you, Jim. Well, I'd rather do that than anything else we've done. All right. Well, let me uh, take this one here and make a note. Jim, this program, this is Guess the Program, ladies and gentlemen. I get programs from my personal collection, and I hit Jim with the card, and he comes up with the location, the date, and the gate. Oh, come on now. Well, you're don't really raise good. The, don't raise the bar <laughs> here. You're really good. All right, here is the lineup. Two other bouts will be announced. But the feature event, one fall, 30-minute time limit. Dino Bravo and Dominic Bravo versus Johnny Costas and Mike Valentino. The semi-wind-up. Best three falls, 45-minute time limit. Ronnie Etchison versus Kangaroo Kennedy. <laughs> okay. And the main event, best of three falls, 60 minute time limit. Saya Nandor from Budapest versus Mike Sharp. Ooh. We are in the province of Ontario. Um. No. No? Not not Ontario, no. God damn it. I was trying to remember what province this is in. <sighs> then you've just told me it's in Canada. It is certainly in Canada. Okay, then it has to be Quebec. It is not Quebec. What? Come on, there's a few All more. Right. There's a few more you can go to to pick from. Well, wait a minute. Okay, we've got Dino Bravo and Dominic Bravo. Now, people have heard of Dino Bravo, but Dominic... I don't know if that was a, I don't think that was a legitimate brother. It may have been a gimmick brother at the time, but since he's working with one of the people on the opposite team is Mike Valentino, that was Baron Mikel Cicluna before he was Baron Mikel Cicluna, and which indicates this is vintage. Ronnie Etchison, best known for being a star in the central states, but none of this rest of this card indicated it would be the central states, so Etchison was still young enough to be on tour. Kangaroo Kennedy has been lost to history. And Cyan Nandor versus Mike Sharp, that wouldn't be Mark, Mike Sharp Jr., that would be the original Mike Sharp. And Nandor was a huge name in Toronto in, was it the 40s and early 50s? So, God damn it, what other part of Canada would this be in the, I would think, early 60s at the most recent, and only because Dino Bravo, how the fuck old was he? Is it the, is it the Dino Bravo I'm thinking of? Or is this an outlaw team that was very <laughs> goddamn uh, just coincidental? Was that a guess in any way? Just early 60s? That's the only thing you're guessing? Well, no. Now, because it, it can't be the early 60s as I'm looking at the rest of these names. That can't be Dino Bravo. I'm going to say... I'm going to say 1955. And, uh, and if it's not... Quebec or Ontario, would it be Alberta? The Sales Pavilion, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Okay. Tuesday, September 18th, 1962. Shit! Dino Bravo is not the Dino Bravo that would become famous later. Of course, that wasn't Dino Bravo's real name, the one everyone knows. Dominic Bravo is Dominic Danucci. Son of a bitch. So Dominic Danucci and Baron Mikel Cicluna were on opposite sides of the match there under their previous identities. It's, uh, okay, that's, again, I'm surprised that Mike Sharp uh, Sr. was uh, main eventing at that late with Cyan Nandor, but it does make sense that Cicluna wouldn't have been around in, in 1955. All right. Well, here's something interesting from the program. Kaniski busy with defenses. The role of a champion can be wearying. Gene Kaniski is finding. Title defenses of his NAWA World Championship and public appearances in that capacity 
are keeping the former Edmonton football star occupied. Because of his commitments in North America, he has been unable to accept some lucrative offers from abroad. And I wonder what her name was, that broad that was making him lucrative offers. And in three nights, just recently, he attended sport banquets in Los Angeles, Dallas, and Indianapolis as wrestling's representative. So there's a little bit about Gene Kaniski. Midget's coming. That's always a big deal. Jim, this next program. <laughs> this one. I just love the way you dropped that in. Midget's coming. Jim, the uh, next program here, the opening bout, Eddie Sharkey versus George Gadaski. Okay. A bonus bout, Bob Boyer versus Mark Starr. A special event, Alaskan versus Billy Red Cloud. The semi windup, Race and Hennig. Versus Parks and Gilbert. The main event, Vern Gagne versus Killer Kowalski. Well, obviously, we are in the AWA. And by the way, is that Killer Kowalski, is that Stan the Big K Kowalski that Gagne is working with? Rather than the original Killer Kowalski? I thought this was killer because by this point I would have thought that Stan Kowalski yep. would have been identified separately. I bet you. I don't know because they, okay, we'll get back to this, but they yeah. brought they brought Stan the Big K Kowalski into Indianapolis as late as I believe it was 74. Try, and Sam Miniker was calling him the original Killer Kowalski. In the Midwest, they they didn't use Walter as often as they did Stan Kowalski because he had been a name for Vern in the early 50s. Nevertheless, Eddie Sharkey versus George Scrap Iron Gadaski in the opening match. This means that was before Sharkey and Vern's falling out. Bob Boyer... The falling out being when Eddie Sharkey shot up Vern Gagne's office because reportedly Vern had hit on Sharkey's wife, right? Yes. Yeah, that falling out. But he only fired three or four shots, and I think he pointed most of them at the ceiling. Uh, Bob Boyer would later become Chief Bobby Bold Eagle and would be partners with Billy Red Cloud in uh, the WWA in Indianapolis for Bruiser and Snyder. Race and Hennig were the top heel tag team in the AWA and maybe in the world at that time. And they were working with Reggie Parks, who would later on be the belt maker and the Gilbert was Doug the Pro Gilbert. Uh, and then Ganyan and, and whatever Kowalski. So this is the AWA. It's gonna be it's gonna be in Minnesota. And what was Race and Hennig's run? 67 through 69, was it? Or 66 through 68? Off top of my head. Uh Billy Red Cloud there. Let's go with uh, 1968 in Minnesota. The date? February 12th, 1967. Ah! I was about to say, uh, I believe it's St. Paul. Yeah, it's St. Paul. St. Paul. That's what it is. St. Paul, Minnesota. I almost went with uh, Minneapolis, but it's St. Paul here. All right, well, that was pretty close. Here's another one for you, Jim. Opening bout, Al Smith versus Cowboy Rocky Lee. Ramu Zabo <laughs> versus Reyes Rodriguez. Big Jim Bernard versus Jack Nichols. For the Ladies World Championship, Slave Girl Mula versus Nell Baker, two out of three falls, one hour time limit. And the main event, one hour time limit, one fall. Carl Von Hess versus Ricky Starr. Oh, good Lord. Um, okay, the, the second and third matches, I can't help you. I don't know who those people are. Al Smith, was. would this have been one of the famous Smith Brothers tag team and they both had beards like the Smith Brothers cough drops? 
I'm not sure. Obviously, that's the only Al Smith I know of during his time. Cowboy Rocky Lee. Why, why am I going blank on who he is or who he became, the other name of him? I am too. Um, Moolah versus Nell Baker means for the world title means it's somewhere after Moolah won the title in 1956 and 1984. So that narrows it down. And Von Hess and Ricky Starr, Ricky Starr would have been working in this country and in main events and with Von Hess. Uh, God damn it. I'm trying to figure out what, that's really the only match I have to even figure out what territory it might have been. Moolah could have been anywhere. Um, this is somewhere in the Northeastern United States in 1961. It is a Tuesday night, February 19th, 1957, ah. Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, at least I got the fucking general geographic location. So this was right after Moolah won the tournament in Baltimore, and she's coming back to defend the title. It has a picture of her face here, Slave Girl Moolah, Ladies World Champion, Luthez, World Heavyweight Champion. The, but this, uh, was this Ed Contos, or the Contos brothers, promoters, at uh, that time? I don't see their name on here, and that's actually what I was looking for, is the promoter's name. We have... Jack Vendetti is the announcer, and it has a stuff about the Athletic Commission. The professional wrestling boom continues full tilt. Proof of the pudding is the turnaway crowd of 19,700, which jammed Madison Square Garden recently. About 5,000 other fans were unable to get in to see, among others, fabulous Antonino Rocca and the artful Vern Gagne. Rocca and Gagne scored a tag team victory over Hammerin' Hans Schmidt and Clouten, and Clouten Carl Von Hess, the villains <laughs> in this particular Trumpist, uh, Trump fest, excuse me. Thump fest, not Trump. Thump fest. Thump fest. All four bone benders are well, <laughs> this is written so funny. All four bone benders are well known to Baltimore Matt followers having thrilled the Coliseum clientele on many, many occasions. Incidentally, in line with the wrestling boom, Coliseum attendance has more than doubled in the last five years. And from Chicago comes word that 64 match shows in the Windy City area last year drew more than 230,000 customers who paid $400,000. And just to think, there were those who laughed 25 years ago when professional wrestling decided to put some oomph into the action. <laughs> Needless to say, the Grapple for Gold Brigade is here to stay. That's an interesting uh, editorial here in this program. What do you think of that? Well, and a lot of times, because in those days, remember, obviously you do, you got a big collection, the Wrestling As You Like It and Wrestling Life magazines from Chicago they would print the attendance figures and athletic commission, the gate figures to, to show how big wrestling was and how popular it was and et cetera. And that was something that the other markets picked up on, but that show, Baltimore at that time was not a full fledged, you know, uh, W there was no WWWF at that point, but it wasn't even a, a Vince McMahon city. He was running the garden, and there were still these local promoters, even in Baltimore. So they got Von Hess from the, you know, the Madison Square Garden events to come in and Ricky Starr. That that's their main event, and then they're using Moolah because she's from the Carolinas, and they're also talking about what goes on in Chicago because the local promoters would try to get somebody off the Chicago TV that'd been hot, like Vern Gagne or Hans Schmidt or whoever the fuck. So Baltimore was, it still wasn't a big money wrestling town in the 50s, but they they got a variety of talent, and it wasn't until Vince Sr. really, it took him years to annex Boston and Pittsburgh and 
Baltimore and all of those towns to make that Northeast one entire territory. Well, there it is, Jim, a rather quick, short guest the program. But and we- I sucked. Either way, on that last one was a rib, though. Give me one match to fucking go on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. How about this one? Real quick. Oh, boy. Now, wrap now, things up. now I've stuck my foot in it. Bobby Thomas versus yep. Cowboy Ronnie Hill. Gene Dundee versus Hobo Brazil. <laughs> Golden Boy versus Billy Graham. Bull Montana versus Tony Sinatra. Midget, girls, midget, girls, baby doll Cheryl versus Dolly Page. And the main event. She would would later work as Honey Girl Page. The main event for the World's Championship Tag Team title, Buddy Lee and Ilio DiPaolo versus Gypsy Joe and Bob Stanley. Jesus Christ. Um. <laughs> oh, by the way, it has it here just to let you know, Leaping Tony Sinatra <laughs> is Paul DeMarco. Oh, my God. Um, Was Golden Boy Ron Dupree? It is Ron Dupree. And Bobby Thomas popped me for a second because that was Thomas Marlin's name he worked as, but it wasn't the, it's not the same one here. Uh... Oh, by the way, here's some news coming back soon. Retired, undefeated world women's champion Alma Mills returning to that action. I'm looking for my title back. It'll be somewhat like when Jane Cargill returned. <laughs> um, Hobo Brazil was a goddamn Jack Pfeffer guy. Gene Dundee was a legitimate talent. Later on, would he he turned into Flash Monroe, didn't he? One of the Monroes? I believe not so. Rocket. One, of, one of the Monroes. I thought it was Flash, but it was definitely one of I think it's Flash. Them. Yeah. Um, God, <sighs> Gypsy Joe, not the Tennessee one, but Buddy Lee and Elio DePaulo, that's Nashville collides with Buffalo. I don't know what to think. I'm thinking this is an outlaw show in the Northeast, whether it's New York State or possibly Massachusetts, from the very early 60s, 1962, 63, does Jack Pfeffer have a hand in this? Jack Pfeffer certainly has a hand in it. And remember, if it's booked by Santos, it's big time. Tony Santos, Massachusetts. Boston Arena, Thursday, June 25th, 1964. Four. I was close. And by the way, the next Grand Ole Opry at the Boston Arena will be Saturday, October 31st. (laughs) Good God, Boston, Massachusetts from the mid-40s through the end of the 1950s was one of the major cities for wrestling, and they had their own world champion. And Boston, a city that size, ran weekly, three weeks at the arena and then a big show at the Garden. And by the early 60s, Tony Santos is running shows like this, and Pfeffer's got his guys in there. Well, let's wrap up with this. Here's the weekly lineup, big-time wrestling every Tuesday. Athletic Field Ballpark, Rain or Shine, Manchester, New Hampshire. Prices 125 and 175 tax included. Every Wednesday, the Arenatorium, Route 6, <laughs> North, da- uh, North Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Once again, 125 and 175 tax included. Every Thursday, the Boston Arena, 238, St. Botolph Street. It has the phone number here. Prices $150, $2, $3, tax included. Every Friday, Witchy's Arena, Route 1, North Attleboro. North Attleboro. That's right, $125 and $175. And every Saturday, Mill Hill Arena, West Yarmouth, Massachusetts, $150 and $2 tickets. So the New England Booking Office for Wrestling, it says here at the bottom, Outlaw guys and a lot of guys who would start there. Les Thatcher started there. Les Thatcher started there. Uh, Ron Dupree started there. Chris Colt started there. Pat Patterson's first place working in the United States yep. was there. That's where he met the love of his life, Louis Dondero, actually while working there. But they actually ran a pretty full schedule. Well, and and that's the thing is Paul Bowser in Boston, as I mean, it was a goddamn 
money making machine up there. It was a huge. They had their own, you know, a wrestling world champion, and they had the the Casey brothers, the Irishman, and it was huge. And then somebody's got to do a study of Boston and and you know see exactly what the timeline was. But by the time that Tony Santos was running this small territory, you see the talent. And it wasn't what it was before, and then that's when, what was it? Not a couple years later, Vince Sr. said, I can fucking annex Boston, take this over, and and there it became, right? Well, eventually he would get Boston, and like you said, and that's an interesting story, just the way he kind of brought the Northeast together, and that was his power base. That's why when Vince Jr. took over in 82, everyone says, oh, he paid a million dollars for it. It was making many more <laughs> millions than that, and he just had to take some of that money to pay for it. <laughs> 